Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to the City of Boulder Transportation Advisory Board meeting for March 11th, 2024. Go ahead and call this meeting to order and then turn it over to Sydney, our technical host for the evening, to go over the technical rules. Yeah, so thank you for attending the Transportation Advisory Board meeting. To strike a balance between meaningful, transparent engagement and online security, the following rules will be applied for this meeting. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions will be limited to three minutes. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using that person's real name. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers or presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. The Q&A function is enabled and it will be used for individuals to communicate with the technical host. It should only be used for technical online platform related questions. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during this meeting. Thanks, Sydney. Well, welcome back. Ryan Schuhard, our former colleague, I see he's on the, the call now. Move on to agenda item three, which is uh, appreciation of service. I think, I think I'm going first. <laughs> okay. um, well, thanks. Yeah, thank you for being here, Ryan. And just wanted to take a moment to say a few words and then I'll hand it to Tila and I also will share um, a little parting gift. So. Uh, just appreciate all of the time and energy that the three of you have put in over the years, um, different varying lengths of tenure. Um, but yeah, just thank you for your service to the important work that we do. Um, and, and I'm especially grateful for just your commitment to the work and your visionary leadership, um, especially with CAN, of course. So um, on that note, let me share the team, um, our sign shop put together uh, these parting gifts for each of you. I'm holding up uh, this Aww. one's Becky's um, as your turn, and then on the back, uh, the right here. So there's one for each of you. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll get these. Meredith will help us get these to you in short. So thank you, and I'll hand it over to Tila too. Well, those are even cooler than I thought they'd be. <laughs> if it didn't screw up our quorum rules, I'd resign right now. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, thanks, Natalie. And um, thanks, Becky and Alex and Ryan. I'm going to talk to you in like reverse order of when I, I met you and, you know, <laughs> roped you into this crazy thing. Um, Becky, I was really so glad when you uh, applied and came out of the woodwork. I hadn't really... Um, realized that you were in town. Uh, and I thought when you applied, I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope this is the one that they pick because this is, she's going to be phenomenal. And you really have, like you've been an outsized um, presence kind of up away from these meetings. Like that's been a real lesson in just sort of rolling up your sleeves and doing the work that needs to be done. And that's really um, a sure sign of good leadership. Um, so I'm sorry to see you go. As I said, when you, you were, you know, thinking you would have to resign at some point this year, I would love to keep you for as long as we have you. Um, and I just want you to know that it's, it's been a short time, but you've made, um, a real impact and a real, um, given us a real lesson on how to sort of connect with other boards and to really sort of realize what kind of, um, voice and influence someone on tab can have just offering some of these connections. I'm really surprised on the parking reform letter that you were able to talk to tab, you know, <laughs> environmental design or environmental uh, advisory board, just that um, not only were they that they signed on, but when I speak to them um, sort of on the side, other people that I know on those boards, they're aware of the issue, they're aware of the connections, and it's a connector like you that makes stuff like this um, really effective. Uh, Ryan, um, I told you not to run for council. Uh, <laughs> I told you to run for tab. And uh, I remember like when we met, we had just met on uh, like email and I forget what it was. And I'm like, oh, this guy, I really got to figure him out and like point him in the right direction. And I remember we went on a bike ride together. Um, 
shortly after you'd arrived and, you know, traveled on multiple use paths. And I just kind of kept poking at you. Like, I really think you should try to get on tap. And you said, I don't think we need another white guy on the board. Mm -hmm. And you were entirely right. We didn't need another white guy, um, but we did need you. You're the right white guy. And for all of the white guys I've served with, and there have been many <laughs> in my time on tap, um, you are the one who kept raising equity and diversity. You were the one who kept raising other viewpoints. You were the one who said, I have small kids. Um, you know, what does this do for lower income people? How do we include those voices? You were so mindful of it from the very beginning. And that was a real lesson in, in inclusion. So jokes on you, you just got handcuffed for, you know, four years <laughs> and I only got a year left. So haha. -ha, but enjoy your time on city council. Um, and I, I look forward to, to you being a, a continuous ally. Let's, let's see what we can get that done this year. Let's see how much education um, and convincing we can do. Um, not just tab sort of shouting into the void, but having someone who can um, amplify and echo the sentiments and, and explain really to the real decision makers in town why these things are interconnected uh, and why they're so important and why we need to pursue them. So I look forward to working under you, with you, and without you once I leave tab. Uh, <laughs> um, and then Alex, it's been, gosh, it's been a long time. <laughs> So I remember I was at a um, just an inform the public event at the at the public library with Bob Yates, Mason Moyer um, was one other person in the, in, on, at the table, but it was just sort of a general information about boards and commissions and sort of the time and commitment and the kinds of things that we do and um, it was you know great little just welcoming tent. And afterwards, I hadn't noticed you in the audience at all because it was a lot of gray hair. I'll, I'll admit there's a lot of uh, people. And this is a subject, a sort of subject also in, in terms of recruiting city council members. It's really people who um, have the spare time to give um, and or aren't so strapped for money that they can't afford to give their time away for free um, that public service like boards and commission membership and city council service call and you're not you're another white guy but <laughs> uh you're another white guy with some excellent expertise you've brought with that with you and I remember you approached me after um we had finished the question and answer at that event and there was this you know this baby face kid who came up to me mm -hmm. takes one to no one uh and he said he, he was you and you, you asked like can you know are you just kind of like a, a rubber stamp is it pretty pro forma or can you really actually change their minds and change directions on stuff? Um, and I hedged a bit because I have worked under a number of directors and some of them are more open to um, thoughts and some of them do think that TAB or have seemed to think that TAB is um, you know, just a step in the, in the charter that they have to go through on certain types of projects. And I said, well, you know, it does kind of depend. Uh, and sometimes it takes years, but I have seen a, a lot more respect um, for TAB members from city staff um, and from transportation directors in recent years. And if you have something really smart and persuasive to say, there's, they're learning to listen, they're starting to listen, and I think maybe you can. And I think with your efforts in particular, you and Ryan on the core arterial network, you really proved that that was right. Um, and as I said, once that got approved by council a couple of years ago, you've really moved the needle on that. And I think that, that you should be proud of that legacy. Uh, you should be proud of what you've accomplished. You should be proud you stuck it out for a full term here. I know it has been frustrating um, and at times very combative. And I am so proud to have served with you um, and to have not misled you, I suppose, at the beginning. I hope that you realize you have made a difference. You've made a change. And I really thank you so much for, for the work and the effort and the frustration and the anger that we've worked through um, because I think you are leaving on a, on a terrific high note. So thank you so much. I'll miss you guys. Thank you very much, Tila. It was nicely said about all of this. I don't know if you all want to say anything, but otherwise we can we can move on to the next. What we yeah, others need to say thanks. Becky or Alex, do you want to do you want to go? You can go, Ryan. I can go anytime, whatever. Becky. Okay. Becky. <laughs> um yeah, well I, I of course want to I'm just really appreciative for all the TAB members and, and helping me get up to speed. Um, there's so much to learn, so much to cover. Um, and 
despite working in like an adjacent realm um in my day job you know i knew nothing about what goes on in boulder and how things work here and um needed had a lot to learn so um i really appreciate everyone kind of taking the time to to help me um in in with your various areas of knowledge and expertise um so i feel very fortunate and also that we could kind of work together so well um that just felt like really quite quite a privilege um so so thank you for that um and uh um yeah and and alex um for five years is a, is a lot of it's a lot of work <laughs> to be on a board and um i really admire um you kind of yeah your your work throughout the the term the uh, throughout your term and also um as others have said with can just that that helping kind of educate council on the importance of prioritization and like what will have the biggest effect in our safety pursuit of you know safe roads um i think has just been um so important and just like really born fruit over the you know the time i've seen the last two years that i've seen of of work um and um and Ryan, thank you for running for council. I, I actually, I tell, you know, a lot of people in my job who ask about what they can do to change, you know, bicycling in their city, I'll often tell them like, well, you, you know, either you're, you need, you need to persuade your leadership or you need different leadership. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, not only, you know, supporting, you know, getting people in office, but putting yourself in office is sort of the biggest, <laughs> the biggest task, um, you know, the biggest effort of all. Um, and it's, it's no small, small thing either to run or to then serve. So thank you for that, you know, huge, huge kind of um, service you're doing. And it does make me so, so excited for, um, for, for what's to come um, from, from council. So um, thank you for that. And then lastly, of course, um, lastly, but not least, I really appreciate everything staff does to make make all of this work, all of the work to to manage our resources, transform our streets and and just and, and to ed educate all of us. Um, and there's always new new tab members, new council members, new community members. I'm sure it's a constant process of of helping us all kind of understand how all the many facets of of your work, um, you know, how they work and and um and why they work the way they do. So I really appreciate that. And I'm I'm so excited for a lot of the big big things um on top this year and I'll definitely be um be keeping taps on it. Okay, I'll just if I could say a few things. Um Tila and Natalie, thank you for for this very thoughtful ceremony. I didn't know what I was getting all in here for us. Uh, so it's it's really exciting to do this with Becky and Alex. Mm -hmm. Um Tila, you are my fairy godmother. You've heard me say this, but you you for this whole process, I um my memory is that I had uh, emailed I think tab about I wanted to get a crosswalk uh, put over Broadway on Calmia, and I showed up to a meeting after the you know initial public comment period, and I don't know how I had your cell phone number, but somehow I came up with it, and I don't think you knew me, and um, you let me come on late. You thought this guy has something to say, and uh, you let me say it, <laughs> and uh, I, you know I was I uh, was I was learning from you then, and I was learning from you, and I I watched you speak it. Council on micromobility and also at the tab meetings, and I just was um, really taken by your um, your demeanor in being able to um, ask for our decision makers to really pause um, with important um, issues and death and mayhem in our streets, and to not just uh, kind of go past it, but to actually sit with it, and um, that really affected me and. Um, I've um, tried to take that on, and I've uh, been very honored to be able to work with you and learn from you, um, and and to learn from all of you. And Natalie, you've been just a great leader, and it's been so fun to get to know you. And um, you're so gracious in letting me kind of, you know, on the advisory group here, um, you know, just say, hey, well, here's what we got to do, and no, we should do that. And you spent, well, at this point, you spent an hour with me today, <laughs> listening to me, and it's just I'm, I've greatly enjoyed you and the team, and. Um, Frankly, I um, came off tab to do this um, run for council because because of the, the transportation department team and a lot of the advocates in this community that make this feel like work that is both important but it's very doable and there's a there's a community of of people who really want to see it happen. So um, I'm in awe of, of the whole team here, the transportation department team, and um, just really grateful for the chance to work with you in this way. Um, and just one more thing, Alex, I think I've told you this, Alex, and I don't know if you remember it, but I remember a, a phone call with you and I was talking about our um, 
we just we have to really strengthen our nexus with climate goals. And um, I went on and on, and you said something like, Brian, you're going to have to run for council if that's what you want. So um, thanks for giving me the idea. And, uh, here we are. Um, and Trina, Sorry. <laughs> thank you for everything you do. And um, I'm just been such a such a, enjoy getting to know you, and um, look forward to working. This new capacity. So sorry to turn on, but thank you all. This is a real honor. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, five years was was quite a, a long time at first, but I can't believe it's it's already come and gone. I had the privilege of serving with a lot of great members. Bill, Johnny, Hutch, Lauren, Mark, Ryan, Becky, Trenny, Tila. It's a, a great group or several groups of people that I'm much better off having had the opportunity to work with. I'm glad I don't like attention, so I'm glad I'm glad I get to share the spotlight with uh, with Becky and Ryan here. And um, I think it it's also exciting to know that there are three three new seats and an incredible group of of applicants who applied. And so very excited um, for you, Tila and Trini, to to move forward with whoever council selects. Um, it's been a huge honor serving the community. I've learned so much from community members, staff, my colleagues on the board. Made, made some good friends, gotten involved in some some great community groups and uh, we'll be off the tap, but certainly involved with things that I never would have been aware of or involved with had I had I not served. So it's been a huge honor. Anything else for agenda item three? Ears on me. We can all get together now and talk now that you're <laughs> off as of Thursday. <laughs> Let's have that happy hour we've been talking about forever and we can talk about whatever the hell we want to. <laughs> and reply <Yeah>. all. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, thanks for, thanks for coming in tonight and joining us. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye for now. All right. Mm -hmm. Bye. See ya. Okay, next up, agenda item four, approval of the February 2024 meet, meeting minutes. Did anybody have any comments or request to edit it? Not seeing any. Entertain a motion to approve as they are. I move to approve the February minutes. I second. All those in favor? Unanimous with four votes. Great job as always, Meredith. Um, just a point of order. Huh. Um, Trina, were you voting on the minutes since you were absent last month? Oh. I guess I can't. So we'll just move ask. Chinese vote to an abstention. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you, Meredith, for catching that. Meredith. That was my main concern. Yes. I thought if we didn't get them done this tonight, it was just going to be me. <laughs> like, oh, that's right. So love. <laughs> thank you for that correction. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. Okay. And now, agenda item five, which is public comment. Any member of the public wishing to address the Transportation Advisory Board about a transportation matter has up to three minutes to do so. If you're interested, please use the raise hand feature within the Zoom platform and our technical host will call upon you. Yeah, so it looks like Paul and then that will be followed by Lynn. So Paul, I'm going to give you permission to unmute if you want to introduce All right, yourself. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. Yep. Yep. I'll start your three minute time. Awesome, thanks. Uh, yeah, first, thanks for everybody's time and hard work. Uh, I know the problems you're working to solve are not easy. So I appreciate your time. Yeah, my name is Paul Sabini. I'm here today to voice my concern uh, for pedest pedestrians and in particular, young children that live on Linden Avenue uh, between 4th and Broadway. Um, just in the four houses that touch my property, there are nine school age children. Um, this is four houses out of over probably 50 that are on this section of road. Uh, these, these students are asked to walk and ride their bikes to school every day and live on a street that has a speed limit that's way too high for a neighborhood. In my opinion, uh, it's 30 miles an hour. Um, there's no shoulder on the road. Uh, there's no sidewalk on the south side. 
there is minimum visibility from any driveway and nothing to slow the drivers down the entire way from 4th to Broadway um, on Linden. Um, I've lived in Boulder for over 25 years. I own a small business down on Pearl Street. I ride my bike to work it every day. Um, and the dangerous situations I see on this stretch of road um, are alarming. And inevitably something tragic is gonna happen um, if something's not done. So, you know, lowering the speed limit is probably the easiest and cheapest thing to start. Uh, but long-term, you know, something more <clears throat> substantial is probably needed, uh, like a sidewalk on the south side um, and something to slow the drivers down. Um, they kind of, people, people in the, the area that don't live on this stretch um, refer to this section of road as the Lindy 500 uh, because they see how fast they can go to make their commute shorter as they race, race to the road. Um, it's a very short section of road. Um, so, you know, going from 30 miles an hour to 20 would probably add somewhere around 15 seconds to people's commute uh, and make it way safer for everybody else. Um, I've been in talks with the city for probably four years now about this stretch and nothing's been done. Um, so, you know, Boulder prides itself on being a safe place to commute, really encouraging people to not use their cars. I do that. My kids do that. All the kids on the street do that. Um, but it really doesn't seem like anybody's listening uh, to the concerns we have. Um, so, yeah, I'm just here to speak up for for the pedestrians and the kids that live on this section of road and hope that, that somebody hears us. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Lynn Siegel, yeah, I don't know how you take all the abuse that you're subject to, really, because of the massive uh, housing boom in Boulder. Um, up at the hill, I had to ride on that one foot section on Broadway, like against the traffic. It's like I'm hurrying across from town to from across town on my bike all the time. I'm rushing from one meeting to the next or something up on the campus. And um it, it was it's just scary, you know, having to walk on my bike in that section and um and this is just happening all over town and you know, potholes in the dark and and you know the faster like what this last guy was speaking about people are more in a rush mode because they're so stressed in their jobs and in everything that it, it's just you know i watch this boom this building boom because i go to planning board and i see over the years and years and decades it doesn't surprise me when i see another thing because i've watched hours of that project getting approved through planning board and it just must be frustrating at TAB for for being at the end of having to deal with that in terms of the congestion and the accommodations to all these extra bodies. And the TOD is not so much of an improvement because you're actually getting more bodies, bodies that are subject to the greater amounts of congestion and cars because people will always have their cars no matter you know the uh, incidents you know in incentives to get them off their cars so one of the things that i've just been thinking about is the airport situation and i really think tab should weigh in on this because that's going to add a huge amount of congestion to boulder along with cu south these are things that you are going to have to be you know like saying i quit you know let somebody else deal with it because there's there's just no way you can you aren't you know the developers aren't paying you're always in some form of deficit and you know the interesting thing is i saw a film on the only airport in palestine is not had limited destinations 19 since 1967 it's basically been decommissioned and I thought the irony of that airport, and now they're planning a settler colony on the side of the airport. It's so analogous to Boulder, like our settler colonies are housing 
everything is like it's this homage, this godlike appreciation of housing. Thanks, when Lenny. you know it needs. Then I remember meeting you for the first time the night of my tab interview, and I appreciate you sticking through all the, the five years with us. Can I just chime in any... really quickly on Paul Sabini's comment? Yeah, I going to ask uh, if there's any. So I'm, I'm really glad he raised Linden. I think it's a really great um, example street of where we might like to see some speed limit reductions. And, uh, you know, that's, of course, something we're going to turn to later this evening. Um, and so, for instance, applying the the, the rubric that um, city staff is, is testing out for, for assessing um, street speed limits. Um, Linden has proposed no change in that section. And another, another leg we've heard about quite a lot um, from um, public commenters is um, spine, um, also proposed not, no change on spine. So um, I'll raise those later on, um, but they are, I think, really good examples to sort of, sort of discuss where the, um, where the engineering judgment might, might um, tip the tables in a different way than, than just <laughs> automatic application of, of the criteria would, would not tell us to change something. Thanks, Sheila. Natalie, any other, well, first, are there any other people wishing to speak during public comment? Take that as a no. Natalie, did you have any responses to the, what was brought up during public comment? Uh, no, I think uh, Taylor's connection to the next item is helpful. Um, and I'm looking forward to kind of getting into the discussion. And I think just to the point that you made, Tila, uh, you know, this these aren't necessarily our proposed recommendations. It's kind of where we're at this point, right? So um, definitely appreciate the point you're making, but let's, I think it'll be good to dig into this. Yeah, thank you. Okay, then we can move on to agenda item six, which is the Vision Zero Action Plan update. First with regards to the community mobility planning and implementation speed and signage update. And Devin's with us tonight to present this item. Thanks, Devin. Yeah, thank you, Natalie and Alex. Let me get my presentation up. Sorry, Sydney, I'm getting an error that says I cannot share my screen. Yeah, let me... Promote you to co host. All right, thank you. Can everyone see that now? Okay, well. Good evening, everyone. My name is Devin Joslin. I'm the city's principal traffic engineer and I'm serving as the project manager for this project. Um, before I begin, I just wanna acknowledge that this project has been a very collaborative effort among um, people within the transportation and mobility department, as well as our stakeholder group and our consultant um, Y2K Engineering. And I also wanna acknowledge um, the data contractors that we hired to collect um, very accurate and timely uh, speed and volume data on a number of these roadway segments that were evaluated as part of this methodology. Um, and lastly, I just wanna acknowledge again that this was uh, fully grant funded through a community mobility planning and implementation grant of $125,000. So with that, I'll dive in. Um, this is the plan for tonight. There's five main things that I'll cover. Some of the material is technical, and I realize that some folks may be seeing this for the first time, um, but hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have a much better understanding of what and why we did uh, for this project. So to recap the project, um, really there were a few main things that we wanted to do with this project. One was to review and incorporate industry best practices. Uh, create a context sensitive approach for setting speed limits on arterials and collectors, improve the consistency for communicating speed limits, and reduce speed related crashes. And really, this is all done under the 
safer speeds umbrella within the safe systems approach. But we recognize that speed limit setting is just one component of establishing safe speeds. Um, some of the others being photo enforcement, which as you know, we're working on expanding as well. So here are some of the project successes. I just wanted to put these up front um, just to again, showcase the real innovation and thought that has been put into this project um, up to this point. Again, it was grant funded, um, but the thing that this slide highlights in particular is that this was really the first time that we've ever done a systematic citywide evaluation of speed limits. And as part of this effort, we completed really what is the largest ever citywide data collection effort. And that's what's shown on the map to the right. All of those points represent data points where we collected speed and volume data on arterial and collector streets in support of this project. In total, we uh, collected data at 206 new locations across the city. And really all of this led to an innovative methodology that incorporates roadway context and innovative and industry best practices. Uh, this is kind of where we've been and where we're going in terms of the project schedule. Um, we started this effort uh, last summer in August with uh, a key stakeholder meeting. We've had three of those touch points along the way with our stakeholder group. And this is our first official touch point at TAB. We had an earlier touch point uh, very early on in the project to give a very brief overview um, at the start of the project. But you'll see now that we're transitioning into the final stages where we'll be preparing our final recommendations and a uh, public facing final report and then it's around the June timeframe that we are required to have all the documentation wrapped up in terms of the grant. And at that point, we'll transition into implementation. Again, I want to acknowledge our stakeholder working group. Um, this consisted of members of Community Cycles, Center for People with Disabilities, uh, the Boulder Chamber, as well as our Transportation Advisory Board. And this group was very helpful along the way in providing feedback on some of the peer cities, um, both you know, who we should talk to and what we should look for, and then some of the best practices to be considered and how those should be considered. In the most recent meeting, they reviewed the draft methodology being presented tonight, and they gave input on the speed limit table, advised on the format and appearance of some of the maps and graphics, particularly for people who are colorblind, and then suggested that some of the ranges be adjusted to lower bounds in some contexts. So in terms of the methodology development, um, I just want to highlight again that this has to do only with um, streets within the city limits uh, and, <clears throat> and streets owned by the city of Boulder. So this, this excludes uh, state highways that are running through the city of Boulder. CDOT is developing their own speed limit setting methodology that is in, its, in itself uh, more context sensitive, um, but it is CDOT who has the authority to set the speed limit on state highway, uh, state highways within the city. This project focused only on collector, minor arterial and principal arterial roadways. Uh, we did not look at any local streets. Local streets are planned to remain 20 miles per hour, uh, whether posted or not. And just the way that we went about this project was to segment roads by existing speed and functional classification. And we ended up with average segments about a half mile in length. So in terms of the methodology development, uh, I'll just get this all on here so you can see it while I talk. Um, again, I spoke to the best practices review that included things like U.S. Limits 2, um, some NCHRP research, as well as uh, looking into the CDOT methodology more closely. In terms of the attributes considered, um, that involved things um, developed within a workshop with the working group. And essentially we 
looked at what roadway factors should be considered when setting a speed limit. That fed into what we're calling the um, process we use to evaluate the need for lower speeds. And what I would say is unique and innovative about this methodology that we've developed is that we have a point system that we developed based on the priority of factors. And this takes into account the prioritized attributes and the national research. Those items all feed into what we call an output and speed limit table. And then there's a flow chart uh, as well that goes along with this. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on it because I think it's just helpful if you see it as I, as I go through this here tonight. Um, one of the key factors was, uh, key attributes considered was the land use. And that was taken from the zoning classification um, within the Boulder Municipal Code. And the way that that um, is mapped across the city is shown on the right. Uh, as you can see down in the table on this slide as well, most of the zoning um, within the city and for the segments that we evaluated falls into the residential, mixed use, and public zoning category. That was the majority of the streets that were evaluated that fell into that category. Um, in terms of the roadway context, we developed a list of 16 boulder specific factors to consider uh, within this methodology. And you can see the points assigned to them in the table on the left and then the overall category and weight assigned to each on the right. So we had a total of 100 points possible to be assigned from those 16 factors. 35% uh, of those fell within the consideration of crash, crashes along the roadway. 35% were given to multimodal considerations, 24% to the roadway configuration, and 6% to um, trip generators along the roadway segment. That fed into um, what we called our tier one, two, and three, which was the need for lower speeds. Uh, a tier one segment received the highest number of points, anywhere from 55 to 100 points, and represents a roadway segment that because of its context has a higher need uh, for low speeds. And then you can see the explanation there on the slide for the other two tiers. Um, medium being a kind of a, a medium need for low speeds and tier three being uh, the lowest need for low speeds. And also on this map, you can see the high risk network highlighted. And I'll speak to that a little later, but high risk network segments were handled um, separately from this process of the tier one, two, and three. Um, so here's uh, a quick explainer about the output and speed limit tables. Um, really, it's the street segment adjacent land use and context that informs the use of the output and speed limit tables. And that is shown here on this slide. Um, the output table is what defines a rounding percentile to inform a recommended speed limit. And you can see everything explained here on this slide. Um, but I'll just try to give uh, a quick verbal example to, to help it make a little more sense. So, for example, if along a roadway we had a recorded 50th percentile speed of 33 miles per hour and a recorded 85th percentile speed of 38 miles per hour. Um, doesn't matter what the actual posted speed limit is, you would go based on what's recorded as the 50th or 85th percentile speed for our methodology. Um, but in this case, if we were to apply the rounded down 50th percentile to 33 miles per hour, that would tell us to round down to 30 miles per hour. If you apply the closest 50th percentile, that would tell you to round up the 33 miles per hour to 35 miles per hour. If you were to take the rounded down 85th percentile, you would take the 38 and round it down to 35. And if you were to take the closest 85th percentile, you would take the 38 
and round it up to 40. And I realize that was a mouthful, but I, I just hope that it helps put those terms in a little bit better perspective. Um, in terms of the speed limit table, the speed limit table is what defines a range with lower and upper bounds that sets the limit of what speed speeds can be recommended to be along a roadway. Um, so you can see things explained here. Uh, it goes by land use class in the columns and then the roadway type in the rows. And again, the, the vast majority, um, roughly 75% of the streets that were analyzed fall within that middle land use category of residential mixed use um, and public. And, and actually, I forgot to mention that for this speed limit table, um, that also includes business zoning within that same category. Um, but you can see here the downtown ranges go from 20 to 25 miles an hour, regardless of roadway class. Uh, residential mixed use um, follows a little bit different range, uh, 20 to 30 for a collector, 20 to 35 for a minor arterial, and 25 to 35 if it's a principal arterial. And um, the ranges for the industrial agricultural uh, land use are shown there on the right, 25 to 35 for a collector, 30 to 40 for a minor arterial, and 30 to 45 for a principal arterial. Um, but really what I want to highlight here as well is that you'll see that those streets that have higher ranges apply to a smaller number of segments. Um, this slide explains the flowchart for the methodology, and this is where the high-risk network comes into play. You can see that's the, the very first layer within the methodology is to ask, is the segment part of Boulder's high-risk network? And if it is, um, automatically we would default to going to the output table and saying that we would use the rounded down 50th percentile speed, which would give us the lowest recommended speed limit. Um, the second layer is shown there in the middle of the flow chart. And that's where that point system comes into play that I described earlier. Um, depending on what tier the roadway is, that defines where you look in the output table for um, what speed you round and how you round it. Um, layer four comes into play when you compare the output with the speed table ranges. And there's essentially three things that can happen when you do that. It could be um, below the range, within the range, or above the range. And what happens if uh, the speed is below the range, as we are saying we would use the lower bound of the range. If it's within the range, we would use the recommended speed from the output table. And if it's above the range, we would use the upper bound of the range um, shown within the speed limit table. And then that fifth layer is really one to emphasize here. That is the use of engineering judgment to validate and refine results along roadway segments. Um, so moving into part three, um, this is where hopefully things will start to um, click for you and, and make sense. Um, this is some examples um, that we've chosen of, of segments that have had the uh, methodology applied to them and have varying ways in which it applies. Um, so the first segment is Arapahoe <clears throat> Avenue. Um, and it's the segment, um, oh, let's see, what's the exact segment? From 17th Street to Folsom Street. Now, this is a segment that is on the high-risk network. Um, it has a posted speed of 30 miles per hour, an 85th percentile speed of 33 miles an hour, and a 50th percentile speed of 28 miles per hour. Um, this is a minor arterial with residential mixed use zoning. Um, so you can see that information shown on the slide. Uh, because it's on the high risk network, we go to the rounded down 50th percentile speed, which uh, 
basically leads us to a recommendation of 25 miles per hour. Um, what I forgot to mention earlier was you can see that along this segment, we had three data points collected along this segment. And that's what's shown in the slide where it says 28, 29, 28. Um, that means that at each of those points, they had a, in this case, two were the same, but one was a slightly higher 50, 50th percentile speed. But that was averaged across the segment to a speed of 28 for the average 50th percentile. And then when you round that down to the nearest um, 50th percentile, you get 25. And because 25 is within the range for that type of roadway, that ends up being the, the recommended speed. So in this case, we're recommending a five mile an hour reduction on that segment of Arapahoe Avenue. Moving to the next example, we have Edgewood Drive from 19th Street to Folsom Street. Um, this is a segment, uh, residential mixed use collector. Uh, when we put it through the points system, we get a tier two street uh, with the data you can see shown there. And sorry, I'm moving fast, but... Um, Collector tier two says, again, you'd use the rounded down 50th percentile speed, existing speed limits 25. The data that we had recorded along that segment was at two points. One said the 50th was 29 miles an hour. The other said it was 23 miles an hour. Average of that is 26, which when you round it down to the um, nearest five mile an hour increment, you get um, 25. So 25 falls within the range for that street. Um, so the recommended speed is 25, which matches the posted speed of 25. No change recommended for Edgewood. Um, this shows basically how we assigned the, the points and the attributes that were um, reviewed along that segment to get the tier two uh, classification. The third example is uh, 55th Street from Flatiron Parkway to Arapahoe Avenue. Um, this is one that when we put it through the points, it comes out as a tier three street. Um, it has an 85th percentile speed of 43, 50th of 38, and it's currently posted at 40. And again, this is a minor arterial within the industrial agricultural uh, zoning. So we say it's not on the HRN. We evaluate the speed, the need for low speed. Um, these were the criteria used to determine that. It falls within a tier three. Um, looking at the tier three for a minor arterial, it tells us to use the closest 85th percentile speed. Again, existing is 40. The data we had said 42 and 45. Closest 85th percentile, when you do that, says you might consider going up to 45 miles per hour. However, the range of speeds for a minor arterial uh, within the industrial agricultural zoning says 30 to 40 is the range. So in this case, we would say the recommended speed limit is 40, which is no change from existing. So in this case, although the, the method itself said um, perhaps the speed limit should be higher, it's the speed limit table in this case that says because of the range um, being highest at 40, we don't want to change the speed limit. Um, so these next few slides give an overview of the preliminary results that we have. And again, these are our preliminary results that we will do a final um, review on and, and potentially be able to incorporate feedback that we hear tonight as well to make changes. Um, really, the, the thing to highlight on this slide, um, and just in general for this project, is that 50% of streets uh, remain unchanged. And I think what that means and what that did is that it really confirms that on those roadways, um, we really feel like the speed was, was set appropriately. 66% of the streets with changes 
are recommended to be reduced by five miles per hour. So if a street is expected to change, uh, for the most part, it's expected to go down by about five miles an hour. Um, no streets on the high risk network are recommended to be increased. 70% um, of streets on the high risk network are actually recommended to be reduced. And then you'll see uh, down at the bottom, and you can see on the map, um, only 10% of streets are recommended to be increased. Um, but again, like that final engineering judgment layer has not been applied to these results. Uh, but I do just want to back up here again. And, and what I forgot to mention earlier was just, um, again, the, the magnitude of what we were able to accomplish with this project and being able to get system-wide results by using this process really is groundbreaking, um, both in the industry and, and for our city. Um, in terms of the recommended speeds, um, this map kind of shows the actual recommended speed limits along segments. And you can see that lower speeds are recommended near downtown. 73% um, of evaluated streets are recommended um, to be equal to or less than 30 miles per hour. And the highest speeds are seen in those industrial agricultural areas near the city limits. 12% um, of the evaluated streets have a recommended speed limit of 40 miles per hour or higher. We say higher, but really the, the highest is 45 miles per hour in this case. And again, the engineering judgment layer has not been applied. So in terms of the next steps, um, we'll be working to complete that final report. We'll apply the engineering judgment um, to these preliminary results and potentially make any final tweaks to the methodology. We do want to finalize the signing practice in terms of how, when we decide to implement these changes, we'll sign them in the field and along these segments. And then we want to finalize the implementation plan. So that is it from me um, for the presentation. Thank you. I know that got a little bit long, but there, there was a lot to cover. So I do appreciate your attention. and. Uh, Welcome your questions, comments, and feedback. Thanks, Devin. I appreciated the work you did after taking this over from, from Mark and the time in the working group. The, we'll say to the tab members that having a couple hours with this during our most recent working group session really helps digest a lot of this information. Hopefully you guys had a chance to take a look at this before tonight because it's a sort of complex progress process. Um, anyone have any clarifying questions first? Yeah. Pretty. I don't have any clarifying questions. I just have a suggestion. I would uh, I would like to see our high impact network be reduced just because we know that, you know, we have issues there and that you know, if we reduce the speed, the consequences can be dramatically different to the outcome of a pedestrian or a cyclist getting hit. So, I mean, I understand the process and and it's, I think it, it's great to hear the high percentage of roads that will be, or are being recommended to be reduced in speed. But I mean, just kind of my, my two cents would be that I would love to see the high impact network as a whole <laughs> just be reduced in speed. Any response to that or should we move on to the next feedback? Yeah, I think what I'll say with response to that is that really um, it is the high risk network that we're prioritizing with our Vision Zero actions. And what that means is that those will be the first streets to see not only speed reductions, but, uh, but other changes, right? So some of our, our capital projects that we're working on, the photo enforcement expansion, how we, again, uh, phase and, and do signal timing, all of those within the action plan say, we're gonna look at the high-risk network first. So I just wanna reiterate that point as well, that it is very much on our radar in that regard. Thanks, Devin. Tila? Thank you. Um, 
I had questions about the attributes and the point systems. Um, just it seemed pretty rough. Um, and I remember when we had when we were going through sort of prioritization and pointing and scoring um, in connection with the um, neighborhood speed management program that they got, you know, tab members were pretty interested in, and wanted to get into the, the nitty gritty of these. And so I just have some questions about what was considered or why or why not. Um, it looks like bike facilities get you five extra points and having a high volume of cyclists will get you 10 extra points. Similar with pedestrian facilities and pedestrian volumes, I think. Was there any consideration of the quality of those, like whether it was a detached sidewalk versus um, a bikeable shoulder? That's probably not true because those are on county roads or just a striped bike lane versus a protected bike lane. Or is it a bike route? Would a bike route count? I'm just curious what the what the bike facilities uh, metric was reflecting. In, in this case, it was reflecting basically just the presence of the facility or not got you five right. points and then the the ridership level being low medium or high low getting you zero points medium um i think it was five and high ten okay so so it was a little bit more fine grain than, than what was on your slide it looks it sounds like um i'm surprised that the lack of a, of a bike facility for instance on linden which we're, we were talking about earlier um wouldn't actually get you some points particularly because there aren't any alternate routes for um people north of linden or they're they're not very direct routes um so curious whether like the lack of alternate routes was considered and why you decided to accord no points on a roadway that might deserve bike facilities but doesn't have any Yeah, I mean, I think we had to, just being brutally honest, I think you had to draw the line at some point, right? And we landed yeah. on 16 that we felt were really most representative of, of what we were trying to achieve and that the, the weighting of those factors, you know, we were comfortable with the, the weighting of those factors being what, what it was in terms of the crashes, multimodal roadway configuration, and the trip generation along the roadway. Okay. Um, well, I, I would suggest rethinking that a bit, um, mm -hmm. partly because, and I have this, this objection every year when we're talking about um, roadway maintenance, um, you know, the heavily used roads that have the highest and the heaviest motor vehicle traffic, they get in the worst condition. And so we end up spending more money repairing those roads more frequently. And we are actually doubling down on decisions that we made in the past to prioritize motor vehicle travel. And in the past, the city has had to make decisions about where or where not to spend money on bike facilities. Uh, and there are often, you know, very valid budgetary ridership, usership, um, land use pattern reasons to not have done that, but to um, allow that to drive consideration of whether we protect vulnerable users like pedestrians and cyclists in the future might in fact be exacerbating um, an inequity or a mistake that we have made in the past about not providing a safer facility for them in the first place. So um, not something we need to settle right now, but I just wanted to raise that as, as, a, as a way of viewing what, what, the, what the value and the um, lesson learned should be if there is no bike facility or if it's a poor bike facility. Um, and if there are no pedestrians there, say on Iris, there are hardly any pedestrians there. And that's because it's a uniquely uncomfortable, um, inaccessible place to walk. There's there's really no there there except on the on the ends, um, and it's noisy and it's dangerous and it's unpleasant. And that's a, a good reason we don't have pedestrians, but it's not a good reason to not provide a better experience for pedestrians. I.e., by re reducing the stress from high traffic volumes and high traffic speeds. Um, did you at any point incorporate the um, prioritization and plans from the low stress walk and bike network map or that that plan in informing whether or not a, a, an area, a street or a segment should perhaps be prioritized or get extra points for consideration in this project? I, I would say not explicitly, and I okay. think the, the the counter to that is that this is a flexible methodology, yep. and it is very it is very nimble to the point that you can, if a roadway to were to get 
either an improved facility or something along the roadway character were to change, it can be rerun through the methodology and perhaps a new recommendation given. Yeah. And this is something that sort of occurred to me about um, sort of testing the, the validity of the methodology or, or, you know, whether we have weighted things appropriately. I'm wondering if, if you've um, done any sort of reverse engineering of your scoring and say, for instance, completely removed any consideration of a pedestrian facility or pedestrian presence. Did that change the scores um, or the, the relative ranking of the streets at all? Because that could tell us that we are either paying attention to something inadequately or it doesn't matter. We could maybe simplify how this goes forward if it's really not changing the scores and how we rank the streets. I would, I'm curious if you've done that. And if not, you know, is there time to do that maybe? We have not done that. Okay, well, consider it. Um, a question on the trip generators. Um, again, I understand maybe your, your scoring was more detailed than what I saw on the slide in the presentation, but it just looked like it was schools, parks, and senior centers. Is that right? Or were there more? Because I'm wondering about things like shopping centers, commercial activity, um, trailheads, are trailheads included in parks, um, daycare centers, library, rec centers. <laughs> rec centers generally have a park with them. Um, but there are a whole lot other trip generators that it didn't sound to me like got included. And if what we're trying to capture with trip generators is, I hope, the presence of more people biking, walking outside of motor vehicles, using transit, how about you know near transit oriented development, for instance. If what we're trying to capture is the presence of vulnerable street users, um, we should be looking at more than just senior centers, um, parks, and what was the other one? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we had schools, park, and community senior center, mm -hmm. um, and those essentially are uh, binary. So it's is is something yeah. present or not, and okay. it, is it present within a quarter mile of the segment? Was the other kind of layer okay. we had added on to that? Well, I mean, it, it, it we're like other cities our size. There are a number of daily trips that are short trips within town. Uh, you know, four miles or less that are done by a motor vehicle or where travelers are, are traveling at, at whatever the posted speed is, hopefully, um, that are not going to parks, senior centers, and <laughs> schools. Um, a whole lot of shopping happens. A whole lot of commuting to work happens. Um, a whole lot of jobs are concentrated in different areas. Um, and I'm not really seeing an accounting for that as a trip generator. So, you know, maybe we've misidentified or mislabeled it. Um, but if that's what we're trying to do, either identify trip generation or identify the local street users, I don't think those three categories are nearly enough to be to be thinking about and to scoring. Um, it would probably be an, an excellent objection to to me and what I just said to say, well, if we included all those things, then we would put basically there would be no section of the city that's untouched. And um, I would say exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not where I was going to take it. I, I will I will definitely check back with the team in terms of what exactly was included in those three categories. But I would also say that we had the thought that it was it's covered somewhat by the zoning, right? And the zoning is really the higher level layer that guides the methodology. So many of those things are are covered. So shopping, for example, might mm -hmm. fall downtown or in the business zoning and then that puts it into a different tier within the methodology I, I say tier but really it's a different box within the output or right. speed table right and my sense was uh, having not really studied it in depth my sense was that those commercial tiers actually trended toward higher speed limits you were you know suddenly going to the closest 50th instead of the rounding down 50th or you were going to the rounded down 85th instead of the you know the closest 50th so um that's not terribly, if I'm correct in my in my reading of those tables, what you just said doesn't really reassure me. It's gotten captured, but it hasn't, to my mind, gotten captured in a way that should be protecting the people we should be worried most about. Um, I remember I was at the first um, working group meeting in August, and I remember leaving that, A, feeling really very interested and very um, energized by by like the intentions and the, the the scope of this project. I think it's a great thing to be doing. I'm really impressed with the work that you've done. I asked at that meeting, should we be merely studying how the world is now 
or should there be some other layer, some other sieve that impresses upon the population what we want the city to look like? So when we're collecting 50th and 85th percentile data, we are looking at how they're using it now. We know we have a whole bunch of very wide straight roads. The, the findings on 55th Street do not surprise me at all. That thing was built like a highway and it operates like a highway, but should it was my question. Should there be places, and maybe this is where your engineering judgment comes in. Should there be places where we say, no, this is within the city. This is kind of in, in the guts of where we want everybody to be. Um, I don't care what the methodology gives us. We want everyone to just chill out the closer they get into town. This was part of our discussion about um, changing the default speed limit on residential streets in the city to 20 miles an hour. We knew it wasn't going to be something we wave a magic wand overnight. And I see this process as being a different era from the same quiver, trying to get everyone to calm down and trying to get them to behave differently than they would on a highway. Um, and so I, I was wondering if that made it, if that, if that landed anywhere, if there was any intentionality either now or in the future um, to deliberately suppress um, drivers' expectations of being able to speed just because a street is pretty darn wide and everybody's speeding on it now or everybody's going 45 on it now. Sorry, I'm trying to fully process the question. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think, I, I mean, oh, I would, yeah, yeah, if you want to chime in, Natalie, go ahead. Well, I, I mean, I've just been listening to the, the comments from you, Tila, and I think, uh, like, my, I think all of this is helpful, and we can take it back and think about, you know, where there's room for engineering judgment, like, we're not going to just let them, the methodology spit out all of the answers right. and then move on, That's right? Clear. So, um, so that's, I think this is why we're here tonight, right, is to hear this mm -hmm. kind of feedback, and then we can go back and figure out what changes we need to consider um, to get to the kind of final place. Okay. Where we um, my last question on this, I think, um, did you consider as part of um, the balancing and whether to round down or up? um total changes or like expected changes in travel time so that was something also that the public comment paul sabini mentioned this evening you know if if linden went from 30 to 20 it would be an extra 12 seconds of delay that's something i've been spending a lot of time thinking about late, right lately um and just curious whether you have um it might be too early on in the process to to come up with that kind of calculation but um Wondering if you've done it, and if not, um, as a suggestion, it could be part of the messaging going forward. You know, this change is so modest for a, an average car going the new speed. You're going, you're going to take six more seconds. We, yeah, we did not explicitly consider travel time impacts mm -hmm. in terms of what what happens if you lower it from thirty to twenty five. How much longer does it take you to travel along a, a half mile? Thing? Yeah, <laughs> I think I think part of the difficulty with that is because we had so many segments um, and then, you know, it's just hard to, I guess, predict, say, a, a, a meaningful route. But but you could certainly contextualize it along a particular corridor. You know, you could pick Broadway north of downtown or something and say, OK, you know, we're going to be changing the speed limit. And if you drive from Pine all the way up to 28th Street, you know. <laughs> It's a three mile segment and you know here's kind of what you could expect so that that could be something we do take um for the implementation phase and think about mm -hmm. how to both educate people and then really re-emphasize that it's not um really much of a burden to them to to slow down in terms of their travel time right yeah i think it's really valuable messaging when it's put that way um, I know that Community Cycles raised some questions in the in their letter to us earlier, well, last week, I guess it was, um, sort of about what the land use is and the bike facility. Some of it you've covered tonight, some of it not, um, but I'm assuming there will be a staff response to that letter. So I don't need to re-raise the stuff in there. I think I think the, the comment about the types of vehicles that are in some of these industrial areas was really actually quite topical <laughs> and, and valuable input. Um, but community cycle, I was on a meeting with them earlier and they were wondering when they're going to hear back or if I'm, I'm sure you, they will hear back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it literally just came in, I think over the weekend. So. Oh, did it? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, thank you. I think if I can just add to what Tila said, I mean, I support what she's saying. And I think that the goal is to create a city where people want to walk, where people feel safe walking, where it's inviting. And perhaps, um, <laughs> sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I got like some strange message here. Um, and, and taking all of those things into consideration, we know that you know, what you were also adding about how really slowing speeds down doesn't necessarily mean adding a huge amount of time to your commute, right? So it's just making the 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 way we travel more efficient and trying to get people to travel in different ways. But in order to, it's like the circle, right? I mean, nobody's going to want to ride their bikes if they don't feel safe or or walk or not that they, they won't want to walk if they're on iris, like Tila said, and it's just noisy and uninviting and you don't feel safe and there's not a sidewalk. And I mean, it's just all of these things that come together, right? So I think we should take pride in knowing that, you know, I think that we're leading the way in many, many ways as to how we're creating these environments for people and just continue to prioritize that above everything, you know, just making sure that people feel comfortable, that it's inviting, and that people, when they're driving into the city, understand that they're driving into a place where they are going to find pedestrians, where they are going to find people utilizing other modes of transportation, and that they have to look out for each other. So that's all I've got for this. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I think um, you know, it's something we do keep top of mind with with our capital project work is really how can a capital project transform a roadway in such a way that you can really set the tone and, and achieve speeds that you want um, along a particular corridor, for example. Um, and that can be done any number of ways with a capital project, as, as you know. But I think sometimes it probably does take something on order of of that to um, change that behavior and, and the roadway context to really ne necessitate a change in behavior. And lastly, Devin, I mean, after the phone call we had today about Linden, I mean, is there anything that we could do to mitigate the speed there? I mean, there's so much traffic. I use, as a cyclist training, I use that road to descend constantly. So it's not, it's, mm -hmm. I see all sorts of people, you know, like this man said, there's little kids, there's people that are walking, there's people racing their cars. So, I mean, perhaps it's something to put in there as, you know, if we're going to implement changes, perhaps make a little note, <laughs> you know, then that's something to really keep on top of the list. I mean... Yeah, yeah, Lyndon has definitely been on the list and I, I've been in contact with Paul, as he mentioned. So we'll continue to be in contact through the, the process. And um, again, the results tonight are not final results. Becky. Thanks, I think yeah, a lot of my questions are answered and you maybe already answered this one, but um, just to be clear, so I, I was thinking about 55th Street and the East Boulder subcommunity plan and the the particularly the uh, STAMP, I think is the acronym, um, the like area with housing, concentrated housing and transit in the future. And, but it looks like that area is still sort of treated like industrial use. Um, so does that then not, is that then saying, well, this won't be a drive, it won't be considered that until those facilities are actually built in the area? Or is it all, I actually don't know if the zoning has been updated. I, I thought it had, but maybe, I know that's been a long project, so maybe it's not. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could just speak to that area and whether it's playing a role here or not. Yeah, it, so specific consideration was not given to that. It was really a snapshot of what are the roadway conditions right now. And the reason for that is because in order to do this citywide, we just had to have a way to, to scale things, right? And a lot of what I didn't show you is the layers upon layers upon layers of all the GIS um, that are behind this, right? And so it is a pretty quick 
um, process that we we established, but it's all it's all based on what's now. But it, but of course, it can be subject to change when when conditions warrant. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I I do I appreciate you know how much has gone into it and and having this sort of um, being able to point to like these factors. You know, this is why we're making this decision this way. I think that is great and. Um, you know, I, so I, I really respect all the work that went into making that, that possible. Um, um, so yeah, so, so thank you for that. And, um, I guess as it relates to this particular area, 55th, I guess then my feedback would be that if, if there is an area that has had the, I guess, I guess stamp of council approval for the land use change in the future, then maybe that's one where engineering judgment can play a yeah. greater role. Mm -hmm. adjusting it mm -hmm. yeah i think that's an interesting point that we can take back and discuss uh because the zoning was changed as part of the plan under the planning process so it would be um, interesting to look at that um, mm -hmm. for specific area where that's the case thanks yeah and i and i can understand why like using the data you have now versus lots of hype you know there might be various hypothetical areas that will change and i can get how that would be hard to sort of guess at if it's not really a confirmed change but if yeah if in this case it is then you know finding a way to incorporate that um would be great um yeah and then I, I just have one i guess one other point of feedback um is um you know I'd, I'd love if there was a possibility to consider particularly on pearl street going as down to 15 miles per hour um this is, I think about Crested Butte's Main Street, um, which is 15 miles per hour. Sometimes it's 10. And I know it's a really tiny little town, but it's Main Street is, you know, for a few blocks, like pretty busy <laughs> in the summer. Um, and um, it does kind of feel different when the speed is reduced um, in that particularly busy area. And um, yeah, I just think on Pearl Street, that could be kind of a, a, a perfect place to really signal that this is a high traffic high pedestrian volume area like we want it to really be welcoming fall modes and that lower bound particularly there um and maybe on the main street on the hill too um just i think could be really beneficial so just one other thing to consider but um yeah otherwise yeah i really appreciate all the work that went into this thanks thank you thanks becky i like that low speed limit on Pearl, really give it the Main Street vibe idea. I have one piece of feedback. I really appreciate the engineering judgment that's baked into this, since I understand that these are all relatively preliminary. The one thing that gives me pause within the parameters that engineers can judge thing is the upper range on the land use classification of residential mixed use and public, which makes up um, a good junk, good chunk of town uh, for the minor arterials. And I think the upper bound was 35 miles an hour. And to me, that that feels rather high for a place where we'd expect to have that much foot traffic generated. Um, I, so it's possible that this is, this is a mute point because it it won't, the engineering judgment will determine that, that it shouldn't be. But I think it should just be a non-starter that uh, certainly on minor arterials, but probably principal arterials as well, that we're, we're looking at 30 or less, given we know how much the speed of vehicles impacts the severity of, of crashes. I think aiming for 30 or less where we have a lot of people on foot would be um, would be a, a slight improvement over, over what's been presented. Yeah, I think... Um response to that right now, Alex, is, um, you know, we can certainly take a look at that again. What I would say is that even though that's the upper range, there was a very, very few select segments where that actually ended up being the upper bound. And I, I don't have a great example at the tip of my fingertips, but um, really, I think, again, if you look within that category of zoning, you would be hard pressed to find one that actually was recommended to be 35, even though the upper bound is 35 right now. Okay, that's certainly comforting to hear, but just almost by definition, it feels a little too high. 
Any other, other feedback or questions on the speed limit setting and signing? Not seeing any. Thanks, Devin. And I think you're still here for an appointee to the pedestrian crossing treatment installation guidelines. Um, I talked to Trini, she's interested in joining the, the working group for that. And if you need a backup, you can take Tila for now. And then when the new board gets to determine their um, appointments, I'm sure Tila and Trini, you guys can revisit this and whatever else you wanna revisit. Perfect, thank you. That well, That's exactly what I was looking for. Appreciate you handling that behind the scenes, Alex. Of course, thanks, Devin. That wraps up agenda item six. Next up, agenda item seven, first matters from staff. Yes, thanks, Alex. And thanks, Devin. Appreciate all that feedback on that item. Um, so we have a representative from Community Vitality here tonight, Regan Brown, and she'll be um, sharing an update on this item. And Chris is here to support. Thanks, Natalie. Hi, everyone. My name is Regan. I am a senior project manager with the city's Community Vitality Department. And I'm here tonight to share a bit of a preview um, into a pilot program that we're launching in partnership with Commutify. So let me share my screen here. Oops. And just to give you a heads up, I can't see hands when I'm sharing my screen, so feel free to interrupt me. Um, but I also have a question slide at the end, so we can wait till the end as well. All right, can someone let me know verbally? You can see my screen. Yes, we can see yes. All right. Great, thank you. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar, Commutify is a tech startup based here in Boulder, and their focus is really on creating platforms to better understand and quantify commuting patterns, as well as encourage um, folks to take sustainable commutes. And so this pilot program is being led by Community Vitality with support from Transportation and Mobility, as well as support from Boulder Transportation Connections. And I wanna first just provide a high level overview of the purpose and the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve through this pilot program before diving into the specific elements of the program. Um, the purpose is really to encourage employers to use financial incentives to shift employee commuting behavior away from single occupancy vehicle trips towards more sustainable transportation methods to get to and from work. And so the result we're trying to achieve here is to support employer transportation demand management programs, raise awareness, um, and education on Boulder's transportation options, reduce single occupancy vehicle trips, reduce emissions, decrease traffic congestion, and support local business. So with that, I'll dive into some of the pro uh, program elements here. So employers in the Central Area General Improvement District, also known as CAGED, and the Boulder Junction Access District, BJAD, are eligible to participate in this program, which is also how this pilot program is being funded is through um, the CAGED and BJA taxing revenue dollars. So we'll be conducting outreach to employers within these districts to encourage them to participate in the program, as well as to determine how much they'd like to contribute in incentive funding um, for their employees. And then, Using our district funds, they will be used to match that employer provided incentive up to a dollar twenty five um, a dollar and twenty five cents per qualified work trip. So that's for a total of up to two dollars and fifty cents in city matched funds per day per employee who does not drive alone to work. 
Commutify will develop an interactive platform for employers and their employees to learn more about the program um, and as well as well as explore the sustainable transportation options that are available to them. Employees will receive their cash incentives on the Commutify platform via a virtual debit card in which the funds can either be spent on local transportation service providers or at local district businesses within CAGED and BJAD. And then lastly, participating employers can apply for the state tax credit where they can receive a 50% tax credit on any funds that they use to invest in sustainable modes of transportation for their employees in which this program um, would certainly qualify. Qualified trips and allowed expenditures. So on the left-hand side here, these are the qualified trips. So modes of commuting in which an employee can earn incentive money. So that includes carpool, van pool, public transit, biking to work, maybe taking a B-cycle, um, e-scooter, walking, or multiple uh, modes of those trips. And then on the right-hand side, allowed expenditures. So just to reiterate, this is where an employee can spend those earned funds. Again, shopping at participating locally owned businesses in the district. They can spend it on van pool fares, B-cycle trips or B-cycle membership, Lime scooter trips, car share, Uber, Lyft, or Park Mobile. Implementation timelines. So we're currently working on platform development and configuration in which we plan to, be to begin platform testing and conducting outreach to employers um, towards the middle to the end of this month. And our goal is to launch the program or the platform and the incentives program officially on April 1st this year. So on April 1, employees can start logging their trips on the platform and start earning that incentive funding. Next steps, um, the incentives program will run until the end of the year. So employees can earn funds until the end of December, but they actually have until the end of January, 2025 to spend their incentive money that they earn. And then we will then evaluate the program, identify opportunities for improvement, likely conduct a survey to employers, employees, just to gain um, a sense of the overall satisfaction with the program, how can it be improved? And the goal is to really hopefully expand this to other areas of the city or at least continue it um, in years to come if successful. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Regan. Any questions about the pilot? Becky? Yeah, thanks. Um, super um, interesting program. Um, I have a, my question, one of my questions is um, the allowed expenditures include include like park paying for parking which seemed kind of counter to incentivizing people not to be using single single occupancy vehicles so i'm just wondering why that's included as a yeah as a i hear you and i can i can respond to that just kind of based on my perspective and then chris feel free to yeah. to chime in um i think one of the intents there is well when some someone parks in a garage they're less likely to be driving around looking for parking. And then in addition to that, we did just launch um, our gateless system and a lot of the downtown garages. So kind of trying to promote that new technology. Chris, do you want to add on to that? At sure, all? sure. I'll, I'll just add Chris Haglin, principal planner. Um, I think it's also if you do have someone who works for a downtown employer and they're committed to using another mode, oftentimes that employer then does not purchase a parking pass for them for one of the garages. So if someone normally takes the bus, you know, four days a week, but there's that one day that they do need to drive, you know, here's an opportunity for us to provide a way to do it. They've earned the money. They can spend it on the park mobile for that, you know, the, those chances when they, or 
those times where they do have to drive. So it provides that incentive to to use uh, you know transit or some other mode most of the time, but occasionally people do have to drive and and we give them that opportunity. Okay, thank you. Um, I had another question and it just escaped me. Um, one of, I guess one question I have is um, the, as far as you said, this is a pilot. Does that mean only, is it, maybe I missed this and apologize if I did, if only specific employers will be included or is it just so, it's a pilot in, in terms of timing? Well, a little bit of both. So at this point, it does just run through this year and the focus is in Cajun, so central area, general improvement district, downtown, and then Boulder Junction. But the hope is if it's successful, we'll find resources to either expand it to other areas of the city um, and continue it in years to come. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. I guess I was thinking it was a pilot within the Cajun, like some certain number of companies within that area were okay. going to be part of it. I, but I see what you're saying, um, that those areas are pilot. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Taylor? And then just to clarify on this, Chris, you and I talked about this at the community mm -hmm. solutions lunch the other day. Um, the employers have to opt in, uh, but the total, what is, what's the total number of employers? Cause I thought that was an impressive answer that you had that, that, that might yeah. be able to opt in here on this. Yeah. So, so in our downtown area, uh, you know, and, and this is pre COVID for me, these numbers um, that we roughly had about 8,000 employees working at over a thousand different businesses. Uh, and that's because many of them are very small shops. You know, there are a few larger businesses, of course, but many of them are small. So a thousand employers. Uh, and in uh, Boulder Junction, including Google, which has the majority of those businesses, I think uh, Will had said there was like 1,800 uh, employees there. Um, so there, there's a wide number of uh, em employers and employees that can opt you know, get into this program. But I think the key thing is the employer has to participate and then their employees are eligible um, because we're really matching the funds that the employee gives. And as I've said, this is kind of like your your parking cash out program on steroids since we're, we're uh, subsidizing it to encourage the employers to do it. And then they can also get the state tax credit for, you know, getting back half of the money they put in. So uh, we're hoping that kind of double incentive really encourages a lot of employers to participate and therefore gives their employees opportunities to earn this spark and cash out money. Thanks, any other feedback for Chris and Regan? Not seeing any. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you all. Thanks, Regan. Bye. And I believe I'm up next. You are, yes. And sorry, I wasn't sure if Alex was going to introduce it. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Chris is here for the resident travel diary preliminary results to share an update on that. Let me let me know if you can. We can. We see you uh, not in presenter mode yet. There we go. Okay, good. Thank you. I am going to move this just out of the way so I can see my slides. But thank you. I, I am really, just a, as a side note, very excited about this project uh, with Commutify. We were about to launch this prior to COVID. And so, uh, it's exciting that we can get it back in motion uh, and get it implemented and really look forward to uh, working with Community of Vitality on it. But right now I'm here to talk about uh, some of our initial findings in our modal shift report. So this is uh, the modal shift report contains the findings of our resident travel diary. Um, We've been conducting this survey since 1990. Uh, we used to do it every other year. And then I think at some point in the early 2000s, we switched to every three years. Uh, this 
survey goes uh, in conjunction with the Boulder Valley employee survey. So we do both of these. So we'll do the Boulder Valley, we'll do the resident, and then we take a year off from surveys, and then we continue that pattern. Uh, the real purpose of both those surveys, and, and this one in particular, is to track travel behavior and trends. This one is for residents, you know, and the other one is for employees, regardless of where they live. Um, we use these surveys uh, to evaluate our progress towards meeting those city goals in our transportation master plan. And it also helps inform uh, staff as we go about planning uh, future projects, um, developing or changing updating policies, and developing new programs. Uh, this is a statistically valid survey conducted by a third party. Um, in fact, the, the same uh, company, although it's been bought out and is now kind of called something else, has been the same company that has conducted it since 1990. So, uh, and several of the researchers are the same People. So they have intimate knowledge uh, of the history of this survey and, and are really insightful into looking at these long-term trends that we see. In terms of the methodology, uh, residents are selected um, and are actually mailed a, a paper uh, diary form and survey. Uh, if you do remember, uh, in the past, we did have a mobile phone version uh, and unfortunately, that company is unable to continue that uh, after COVID, but uh, we did make a, a valiant effort in, in trying to do it uh, via mobile phones. But the diary forms have worked for over three decades and continue to. Um, all the results of the survey are weighted uh, by demographic characteristics, so we can get a representative sample. Uh, and we do get a, a good enough response that we have a very small sampling error at the 95% confidence interval of just 1.3%. Uh, uh, this survey was uh, done in September and October of 2023, and we had just about 1,000 respondents uh, that recorded over 4,400 trips. Our, our goal is always to get at least a thousand. So we were just shy. Um, and I want to present to you some of the key findings that we're seeing uh, in this, but this report is not complete. Um, this is kind of give you a little preview of those. Uh, right now, staff is working on a, a evaluating the findings and working with the company to to finalize that report. But we thought there would be some interesting things we could share with TAB uh, prior to uh, looking at publication. And then if there are things that are very, uh, if you're interested in, we can also see if we can run some additional analysis and cross tabs uh, to get those things into the final report once it's published. Um, one of the key findings in terms of the modal split of trips is that we continue to see uh, declines in single occupant vehicle use. So um, this is one of the two TMP goals that's directly uh, related to the findings of the resident travel diary survey. So we do have a, a 2030 TMP goal of reducing uh, uh, 20 to 20% 20 of all trips being in a single occupant See vehicle. You can see over time we've made steady progress, but um, we are we are not on track to meet that goal despite the progress that we are being made that we're seeing. Uh, over time, it's interesting. We've also seen a decline in multiple occupant vehicle use. You know, the most commonly this is carpooling. Although in the city of Boulder, we know from the surveys, this is often either driving just with friends to social events or driving kids around. Um, we've also seen uh, an increase, a steady increase in bicycling. Um, the bicycle mode share uh, also, and for this, uh, at this time contains e-bike and e-scooter data, but we are working on uh, separating that out and providing some additional charts so we can begin tracking uh, e-bike usage and then also related to uh, our e-scooter program. Um, we've also seen increases in foot traffic uh, over the years as well, but those highlighted rows uh, indicate statistically significant changes. The second thing we track in the resident travel diary is daily per capita VMT. Uh, this is one of our newer TMP goals of looking at what is the total 
uh, estimated vehicle miles of travel that the average Boulder resident does on, on their average day. Uh, and so we've just really started tracking this uh, with our last TMP update. Um, right now, we're looking at about 11.9 miles per uh, day um, for the average Boulder resident. And you can see that it's broken down in terms of single occupant vehicles and multiple occupant vehicle trips, taking into account the the, the vehicle occupancy of those multiple occupancy vehicle trips. Our goal by 2023 is to reduce that to 7.3. This is uh, directly related to our climate goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80%. So we did some, some uh, math to basically figure out um, when we started looking at this, what would vehicle miles of travel need to decline to reduce uh, the portion from travel behavior um, to meet that uh, GHG reduction goal. Of course, there's other things that go into account in that uh, vehicle fuel efficiency, electric vehicle adoption and use. So uh, travel behavior is just one of the components, but we figured out we needed to get down to 7.3. So again, um, since we've been tracking this, uh, we have seen a steady decline uh, in VMT. And also I went back and just kind of calculated it throughout the years. So we can see that back in 1990, average Boulder residents were almost doing 16 miles a day in a vehicle. The height was reached in 1996 at 17.7. Uh, but then again, we are just under 12 uh, right now, according to these survey results. We've also been tracking transit uh, trips, you know, the whole time as well. We we certainly have seen a statistically significant increase in the amount of people taking uh, transit, and you know, in this case, the highlighted role of making at least one trip during their travel diary period, and that is a, a 24 hour period where we ask them to record all of their trips over a block. Um, so, um, you know, the amount of people taking at least one transit trip on the day that they were asked to do that survey, uh, it has doubled since 1990, but we are seeing a decline um, since, you know, say 2009. Uh, and, you know, we could certainly say in, in the recent future, this could be due to RTD service cuts. Uh, and it also related to EcoPass access as well. But this is certainly a trend that we are watching carefully. Um, we do know that the EcoPass is one of the most powerful tools that we have in our, in our TDM toolbox to change travel behavior. So we have been keeping track of not only access to the EcoPass, but also the use of the EcoPass and the impact it has on overall travel behavior. Uh, one thing I just wanted to point out on this slide is that we we did with COVID see a, a, a significant decline in the amount of employers that are participating in the RTD program. The city is, uh, uh, very much engaged uh, with Boulder Transportation Connections and the Boulder Chamber Chamber to reverse this trend. And, and now that uh, you know we've got people coming back to the office, even though we're in this hybrid environment, getting them to uh, return to the EcoPass program just because we know how powerful it is. But you can see that we have, for years, we we had over half of the population having access to some type of EcoPass whether it was their employer or the neighborhood or through CU. Uh, but we, we've slipped above that halfway point in this last survey. And most of that is due to the decline in access through employer. Um, as I mentioned, the EcoPass is one of our most powerful tools in changing travel behavior. Uh, you can see uh, on, on the left, the two bar charts, the difference is uh, people taking transit over the years whether they have an EcoPass or not. And you can see uh, people with EcoPasses are significantly uh, more likely to take transit. But on the right side, it goes beyond that. Not only do they take transit more, but we also see that they bike and walk much more as well. So this is something that we've seen over time is that once people have an EcoPass in their pocket, not only does it affect their transit use, but it affects all of their travel behavior. So this is why it's, uh, again, one of our most powerful tools. 
Um, but we also have other things that that we see over time impacting travel choice. Um, we see that access to vehicles is another prime thing that changes travel behavior and whether or not you know a household has uh, one, uh, zero, or many vehicles really affects the travel behavior of the people in the household. Uh, you can see that the single, single occupancy vehicle use uh, is almost double of uh, depending on the act level of access to vehicles. Uh, and certainly bus, bike, and walk uh, are significantly higher for those that have less access to vehicles. Uh, one of the trends, uh, especially since uh, the pandemic that we've been tracking is telework status. Uh, you can see that there's been significant changes in telework um, behavior among our population, uh, almost a doubling of people that claim that now they work from home every day. So 12% uh, in 2018 uh, and now uh, almost 23% in 2023. Uh, we can also see is the one to four times a week has, has basically tripled as well. Um, and only about, uh, uh, let's see, what was I going to say? Oh, only about 25% of our survey respondents said they do not telework ever. So uh, that's a significant trend that we're going to see. And certainly, you know, not making a work trip and, you you know, there's two in a day has a significant impact. Um, but of course, there's negative things to telework as well, especially when we think about our reliance on sales tax dollars uh, for everything, especially funding transportation. So double-edged sword, of course. Uh, I'd like to just close out with, um, you know, this slide, which I've always found interesting is, you know, if, if every resident in Boulder behaved like a university student in terms of how they travel, not maybe all their behaviors, but in terms of how they travel, we would be meeting our, our TMP goals. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we can look at, you know, students definitely make different types of trips, but uh, they have access right now to their college pass, eco pass. Um, they have bike share memberships now. We're seeing the use of Lime scooters. You know, uh, this survey was done just um, uh, after the citywide launch. So Lime scooters really hadn't exploded yet. Uh, it will be interesting to see it next time. But um, those are, um, you know, significant travel behavior uh, changes we've seen by students and if we could all do that, we'd be meeting our goals. Trini, I see you have your hand raised. Can I answer a question now? Yeah, I guess my my question has to do with how the participants were selected and what their the trending age and sex is. Mm -hmm. um, just yeah. find that interesting. Yeah, so we we do a, a random selection of households uh, within the city. So we randomly select households to receive the survey, and then there are instructions on who in the household should should answer it based on, actually, it's based on their the person who has the closest coming up birthday is how we randomize that. But they're randomly selected, um, just a pure random sample of households. But then once we have the findings, we do know the demographics of the city uh, from various things like the census and national household surveys and stuff. And then we can weight the responses to, to those demographic characteristics based on uh, age, gender, uh, and um, age, gender, and I think we do income as well. And I guess, were there any um, youth involved in the survey, like any teenagers, any other than um, no teenagers. This is a survey that is, um, well, it's 16 and up. So it's if you can drive or not okay. it, it is the survey. Um, but there are, you know, issues, of course, anytime you have minors. Um, we don't have a lot of, of young people, uh, but we do usually have a, a good amount of CU students that answer. And given that they're, you know, almost 30% of our population, it's important to, to include them as well. 
I was just curious about how the Zero Fair for Youth program, I mean, if that was kind of, mm -hmm. I don't know, helping these numbers. Yeah, I can certainly, you know, dive in a little deeper into that, um, especially we do ask specifically about school trips and how they went to school. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the time, it's, you know, parents answering the survey about them maybe dropping their kid off of school. But if it is um, someone younger, then they do answer about their school trip and we do um, separate like yellow school bus from RTD. So we would be able to find out that sample size will probably likely be fairly small. And so, you know, for something like that, the sampling error would be, would be larger. Well, thanks so much, Chris. You're welcome. All right. So I did have this as kind of my last slide. Um, so in terms of our next steps, um, we're, we're continuing to review um, the, the raw data and the results uh, and the report itself. Um, we're identifying any additional cross tabs or analysis we may want to run. Uh, this is specifically related to uh, our equity work. Um, so there is some additional demographic analysis happening right now, and also with micro mobility, since that's something we want to highlight. So, um, you know, there, there are dozens and dozens of questions. So when you think about the, the possibility of cross tabs, and analysis you can run, it's pretty much endless. And so, you know, we've, we've got to figure out, you know, where, what are we most interested in finding out? Uh, and so staff is working on that right now. I'm, I'm would be happy to hear any, you know, thing from any ideas from tab of things that you would be particularly interested in. And if we have the data in it, we can certainly uh, have a uh, have the that analysis answered for you. Um, we generally, you know, see this report published in the second quarter, so we have plenty of time to 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 look at the report and run some of that additional analysis. Uh, and then, just as a final note, um, purchasing is having us do an RFP uh, process to select a new vendor. As I mentioned, our, we've been using the same, essentially the same vendor since 1990, um, which is great, has its advantages, but also I think this will be a great opportunity uh, to look at what other vendors could offer in terms of technology uh, to really maximize uh, response rates so that you know we can have a very good, statistically significant low sample error survey. So that's up next. So happy to answer any additional questions you have. Um, if you like, I can um, unshare my screen or we can, um, I can go to a slide if you want me to go to a slide as well. Tila? Thanks, Chris. I always like this kind of stuff um, and I forget, and I know it's been asked and answered in previous years, do ride share like Uber, Lyft kind of things, do those count as MOVs? Are we categorizing them and counting them? Uh, yes, they they are. Um, they are, part, if you say you're in a multiple occupant vehicle, you have a number of different sub choices of that category, including Uber and Lyft, um, you know, van pools, uh, regular carpools. And then if you are carpooling, we do ask, you know, if it's like with adults or other children as well. Okay, interesting. I've been here so long. I remember when this was a newfangled thing. Yeah. <laughs> we had to figure out how to code it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we've had to add a many categories over the years. And you know, <laughs> now it's like e-scooter. And then if they answer e-scooter, we've got to say, well, is it a line? Public yours? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, your personal one as well. Uh -huh. so, um, yeah, there's a lot of nesting answers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think the only other the comment that I had was uh, when you were talking about, you know, if everybody behaved like a university student, we would meet our goals. Um, it's nice to hear because, of course, the university students are often in these forums cast as like, you know, evildoers and couch burners and <laughs> terrible things. But at least they're good travelers. And I think the one thing that you did not mention that's affecting their travel behavior is, of course, the university has very little and expensive private motor vehicle parking. Yes. Uh, and so we know that pricing parking appropriately can actually shift behaviors. And I think this is a, a data point we can point to that says it works in Boulder too. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're not so special on that front. Um, 
So anyway, just thought I would mention that if you're going to be discussing yep. this further, I think that that is a very salient point about affecting their their travel choices and travel yep. behavior. Yes. And in our employee survey, we do track whether or not people have free parking at work or if they pay to park. Um, we do know that I think about 90 percent of people have free parking. You know, it's really in our downtown Boulder Junction in the University Hill area where we have paid parking. And I think we know from our, our downtown uh, surveys, because we all always, when we do the employee survey, we oversample the downtown and we see that strong connection of the carrot and the stick of, you know, we're going to charge you for parking, but here's a free eco pass. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we've seen, you know, the the SOV mode share for our downtown drop below 50 percent. Um, and, you know, it, it's hard to find another central business district in a, in a town our size that has that. But that's because of of, of both the carrot and the stick. Mm -hmm. approach. Yep. And of course, parking availability, free parking at your place of work is assuming you have free parking at home. And that's also complicated for university students. True. Very true. Just an observation for me. I know we've been told previously that we haven't seen a reduction in, in average daily traffic on a lot of our regional streets. Um, we did, you know, in the heart of the, the beginning of the pandemic, and then it's it's rebounded. Um, but that, that's under the condition. The working conditions have changed pretty dramatically. Doubling the five people of working from home five days a week, and the one to four was up from ten to thirty two. I think that just underscores that most trips aren't commute trips and we've historically yep. really invested in the the regional brt projects but it's the the lot of shorter trips that really make up people's day-to-day -day commute patterns and i hope that's what we're gonna try to prioritize with can but um, mm -hmm. yeah, it'd be interesting to see like the total bmt eliminated by the change in, in work patterns because um, i think that's a pretty it's got to be a huge number when it comes to emissions. Mm -hmm. And and that's something we we can calculate. I haven't calculated that yet, um, but it's certainly something we can do. And, and it may be more practical on the Boulder Valley employee side of things, uh, given that we know where people live or their nearest major intersection. And we don't know their place of work because that's how we do the surveys is through the employer. Uh, and we can look at um the average days a week of telework and and I think we can quickly find out what that VMT delta is um due to increase in telework so um maybe more on the employee side than the this residential survey but I'll, I'll gotcha. still look into that I'll look into that good idea cool. thanks Chris anything else for Chris this evening saw so Becky dropped off about 10 minutes ago from a previous commitment she let us know about. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Have a nice night, everybody. Thanks. Um, Natalie, anything else from staff? Nope, that's it from staff. Well, that brings us to matters from the board. The main thing we had on our agenda was finalizing our letter to city council in advance of their retreat early next month. Um, we discussed what to include in it briefly last week. I provided some uh, copy on CAN, Becky on parking and Tila compiled it all and sent it out shortly before the meeting. I don't know the best way to go about this. Um, I guess Tila wrote it. So Trini, do you have any initial feedback into this other than to thank tila and you guys for all your work i think you did a great job so i had a chance to look at it a little bit before we jumped on so cool Tila, i saw one question in here about the extents of the 30th improvements i think it's pretty much the whole street is in from baseline to the diagonal they're all okay, in so various stages. Baseline to Aurora, okay. design funded. Aurora to Colorado, one project. Colorado to Arapaho-ish, another project. Right, that's... And then Arapaho to the diagonal, the most recent. 
Okay. Safe streets for all. Um, all right. I'll just take out that um, bracket a bit. Um, I also, in looking at the slides that Devin shared earlier, it didn't look like this section of Iris Avenue is on the high risk network. Uh, I pulled up the map and it wasn't entirely on it, but I thought a piece of it was. I think I think the piece of it is uh, from 28 to like 47th or whenever it turns into diagonal. Can staff confirm any of this? <clears throat> Devin, I don't know. Are you still with us, Devin, on the high risk network Not for Iris? What segment isn't included? Yeah, let me pull up one resource really quick just to confirm. Thank you. Looks like it stands Folsom, both east and west of Folsom, not all the way to 20th and not all the way to Broadway is what I'm seeing okay. in the Vision Zero action plan with the draft March 2023 yep. stamp on it. It's the final, it still just has a draft. <laughs> So can I just change it to a portion of this corridor? Sure. I'm just working in the Google Doc I shared earlier. So, so that that is correct. Okay. Iris Avenue, the high risk network segment goes from 19th Street to 28th Street. Okay. So, all right. And and then again, um, east of 28th from. I guess we call it 29th to Foothills Parkway. Um, I included the Becky's original um, point about the NPP except I just said suspend it, which is something Tab has asked for before, as opposed to she was proposing we expand it citywide everywhere, which I don't like. Um, <laughs> so I didn't realize at the time that she was gonna drop off early. She has signed off on this draft via email to me earlier, um, but I might be more comfortable just taking out any mention of the NPP, that's point C under number two at the bottom. Uh, it would also help us- I like that. Pages. You like it? Yeah, it reminded me of with CAN proposing not just new things, but some ways to free up bandwidth. And this felt like mm -hmm. an attempt at that. Mm -hmm. And in a way where, where you know, the sport is probably created, or we've had staff and consultants come to present things to us and given them nothing useful in right. response to the immediate thing. And so I, I think this is a, a fair thing to do to okay. for staff if that's going to potentially continue. Honestly, it would probably be up to the city manager's office to do it. That's who we've asked to do it before. So okay, any other feedback? The Cambridge style thing was a surprise to me. Oh okay. Um, uh, okay. So we've mm -hmm. talked about it on and off forever, but I didn't know that we'd landed on including it. I, I think it, I, I wasn't sure. I just included it, um, you know, to be to make sure the stuff didn't fall off. Um, I suppose the one thing, Alex, I should point out that did fall off was the discussion of the upcoming downtown mobility study. Downtown, it's not the right word, but um, I was like, it's coming up. We don't really yeah. have to ask for it. I didn't really think it deserved room in this letter. Okay, well, th thirty feels similar to that, or yes, yeah. just something coming up but yeah not if those um, okay so on the Cambridge style Wilson. ordinance that was something that Becky raised in her earlier you know proposed draft before the February mm -hmm. meeting um, I know that she has talked to a couple of city council members about it so it won't be fresh to them um, I'm not sure and she and I had talked about it. I'm like I'm not really sure the ordinance um is the way to go, but there was some discussion at last month's tab meeting kind of about an ordinance versus um, changing how the, um, let me out here, the, <laughs> um, uh, 
the codes and standard design and design standards um, work. And then I think Alex, you were the one that said maybe this would be more appropriate to include in the next TMP update. So, I mean, we just, we hadn't really landed on anywhere in particular, um, but there had been discussion of it. And so I just kind of threw something in that I thought would meet Becky's original thing that I could maybe agree with, but it's up for us to decide. I'm happy to pull it out entirely. Uh, Trini hasn't really been I spoke with, that discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. I spoke with Becky shortly after our meeting mm -hmm. and I've spoken with, um, other community members and a council member too about it. And I think where I would be most supportive if it is if, if it started just by focusing on CAN and then mm -hmm. maybe because those I think are corridors that there's a finite number of corridors and they're corridors that staff are most familiar with. And so yep. there's a understanding of some of the constraints. And I think if council were to pass an ordinance, it could provide teeth if it's limited in scope, which CAN is. And then yeah. to my Concerns about being a having a broad ranging ordinance. I still think that might be something that's most appropriately okay. done as a part of the update. So, so the last sentence in that section, the consider development of a Cambridge style section, we could say um, council should mandate at a minimum that all project can projects meet the multimodal safety standards identified in our existing plans. Yada yada yada. Um, and I can pull that sentence up to the top, uh, where we mm -hmm. say you know reinforce development of can. And then take out the rest of C, like remove a, just development of a Cambridge style ordinance, but have this st statement that like specifically for CAN projects, we should at least be meeting this minimum standard. How do you feel about that? I like that. that. Yeah, I think that'd be a good gesture from council as far as what they're asked for with CAN. Okay. Trini, are you in agreement with this? Yes. Okay. I mean, obviously I tried to um, make this multi-part list look less multi-part. <laughs> like, no, one of my first impressions was how technical it looked, which I think might be uh, how we've um, evolved in our approach to these. Yeah. So a lot of sections and footnotes. And... So I've added to the end of uh, 1A on reinforced development of CAN. Okay. In particular, council should direct that all CAN projects meet the multimodal safety standards identified in our existing plans, comma, or meet national best practices for multimodal safety outlined by the National Association for City Transportation Officials, NACDO, of which Boulder is a member. <laughs> and then I'll just change. Ongoing work on staff identified prior look, ongoing work on staff identified priority corridors and other upcoming projects include colon and then one two three. Okay. okay. Remove the rest of C. Race parking reform. Okay. Any further edits, changes, suggestions, reorganizations? If you make the footnotes a little smaller, would it all fit on two pages? Yes, it will. Um, so in another, okay. I, I drafted this in another program and all of the previous text fit in two pages. And then I moved it over here to to Word so we, or to uh, Google Docs so oh, I can share it better. Okay. And it redid some stuff, but I can translate it back. It'll fit two pages, no problem. Okay, the one thing that the mention of pick tig, I feel like, the why there might be lacking a little bit. Okay. Maybe. <clears throat> the gloss why. over. Like it's happening. You're sort of explaining, mm -hmm. urging council to accelerate it. Mm -hmm. So the why of why okay, it's happening, or the why of why to accelerate it. Of why to accelerate. I guess you got it in the last sentence there. Just feels like a. It's it's probably fine. Okay. I'm good with it. Well, as is. Excellent. Thank you.
Trinity, Trinity you happy? Um, oh, can you can you guys hear me? It's just I'm, I'm in the document. Yeah, we can, yeah. Um, I guess the only thing is what we discussed, Alex, about having can projects be seen as something that has to be pre-authorized by city council and not like individual projects that need to go through this process. I mean, would that be a good place to incorporate that verbiage in this letter? I mean, just to avoid all the time that that an effort that is put into a process that since it's already been approved, you know, why would we have to, you know, go through community engagement and go through all this, you know, I mean, that's just something that maybe until attorney and I were talking, and I guess I brought up a point. The thing I picked up from Ryan, where he's emphasized like change models and focusing on networks, not litigating things quarter by corridor, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but implementing something that's got a more comprehensive vision to it. Right. And so, Trini, maybe you're getting to the point that that could be better emphasized in this introduction to the CAN piece. Yeah. So that was kind of part of our discussion last time, you know, like where, where does this live? Does it live in an ordinance that happens as part of the next TMP update? Is it a Cambridge style ordinance specifically about CAN? Um, is it bigger than that? Um, and I think in this I case, also it to tag on to the yeah. CAN quarters are intended to connect to one another, like that sentence. Uh huh. Like, bulking that sentence up might accomplish what Trina okay raised. <clears throat> you want to take I a stab at inserting some wording there to try to <laughs> emphasize it someone want to take a stab at oh i thought alex was going to do it um about each one forming a critical function to an overall network. How about can quarters are intended to be thought of as a network? Well, they're supposed to be like the basis of a network. network. They're like where we're starting, but they're supposed to like model how 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 the network would work. Mm-hmm. So can quarters are intended to be a model of a safe system of roadways for a variety of daily travels across Boulder. I don't know if that changes the okay. message in my Yeah, so I'm not quite understanding what you want to change. That's why I'm kind of grasping how much you do it. Oh, the, the third. If, if we lose one link of the, the network, the whole network suffers. It's not and a network then. By yeah if we litigate each segment on a segment by segment basis, okay. we might not reach the conclusions that we would if we are evaluating the system, okay. the future network. How about, can corridors, how about can corridors are envisioned as an interconnected network? Sure. Yeah, that's better. Okay. And sh maybe we should specify that they should not be thought of as independent. Um, okay. Because otherwise. Not independent, disjointed. Mm -hmm. um, rather than, um, yeah, independent road segments. Mm-hmm. Or isolated road segments? How about isolated? Good. Yeah. Okay, does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Great. I think they're all in the TMP, so it's not like it's, this is just like a strategic plan of select TMP segments. I don't know if we ever mentioned that we don't mention the TMP much. No. 
multimodal safety standards identified in our existing plans, I can just reference the TMP there. Sure. Okay. Chuckle, the, the new tab members are going to have a ball learning all the acronyms. <laughs> well, if we get Darcy, she'll already know most of them. Anything else, Trini? Nope. That's a good ad. Excellent. Well, and there's one attachment that comes with this. Yeah, so that's Becky's letter um, that all that other board members signed that got sent to council in December. Mm -hmm. I have that, um, so I'll attach that. And then you'll send that to Meredith. Is that correct, Meredith? Yes. Yeah, is that the way I should do it, Meredith, submit to, to you, or should I submit to city council directly and then copy you, or? I don't remember how we did it before. <laughs> I, th I think it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. I've, well, I've seen it's kind of been like going both ways. I think you can probably submit it directly. Um, that's probably the way to do it, and then just copy. Tabs yeah. Okay, we'll do. <laughs> Sorry. Sounds good. Thanks, Tila, for compiling all this. You're welcome. <laughs> I think next up, future agenda topics. From what Becky and I heard at our last agenda setting meeting, there will be all of the bringing on board the new members next month, but also a fairly full agenda. Oh, okay. Yep. Already. Um, things are ramping up. <laughs> Lots of items. In summertime. <laughs> um. So that's uh next Wednesday. Is that right? Usually. Agenda setting. Uh, it's usually mm -hmm. Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday. Okay. I was gonna say I have a conflict on Thursday, but I think I'm good on Tuesday and Wednesday. We probably need to get that to you. <clears throat> That'd be oh. nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The appointment. Thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Trini. If you can make it, I think it'd be useful for both on. Absolutely. And to yeah. And if we need to, you know, after April, we can reset those. Two. Right. Okay. Yeah, that was based on Becky and my calendar. Yeah. And then, of course, I think we're gonna probably we'll be talking about the retreat timing and topics. It's a little odd because this year. The council retreat is later than usual. Um, usually, usually there's like a several month gap between the council retreat and the tab retreat, but um, this time they're gonna be closer in, but I still think we should probably be planning for a retreat in May. Yeah. For yeah, tab, can, so. Maybe at agenda setting next week, we can start to like lay out some ideas around. Yeah, that. cause by then we will know who the new members are and I can reach out to them and see what their availability is looking like. Cool. Okay. Just, to be, just to be clear, you guys are going to be sending out an invite for the agenda setting meeting, right? To yes. Okay. Thank you. It's next Tuesday at three, so that's a problem. We can that's fine. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Alex, you feeling like a horse is getting close to the barn? <laughs> <laughs> You're starting to run. Like, like, get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brings us to agenda item nine, adjournment. Can I please get a motion to adjourn? I, Come on. A lot of good I, restaurants closing at nine. <laughs> Don't make it. End. <laughs> and then Alex, training with the motion, Tila, is that a second? That's a second. <laughs> You've been a king of kings. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your chairmanship and your leadership. Enjoy the rest of the night. Pleasure. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good night.